All right, we heard the recording notification, so I got to talk in hey words. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar. Uh, game on. Thanks to Studica for putting this together. Uh, I guess we'll dive in and kind of go over all the fun topics today, except that I lost my speaker notes, which happens every, there they are. Okay. Every time I do a presentation, I lose my speaker notes, like 100%. So that's me. Uh, I'm Thomas, or Tom, Thomas Winkley. I work at Unity as a technical marketing advocate, and I work here talking to educators and nonprofits and academics about Unity and game development and what it's like if you teach that in the classroom. So stoked to be here with you all today and talk through some things and then answer questions as best I can. So a couple of things we want to cover today. First of all, why computer science and game development? What Unity Ed Lab is and how you can utilize that to teach computer science and game development. And then I'm going to show you a little bit about how it functions and how it works. And then we'll do Q&A. Uh, so pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Also, of course, if you have questions while I'm speaking, you can throw them in the chat. I'm pretty good at noticing that and happy to kind of riff on that and talk through it with all of you. So just let me know. So Unity, if you're not familiar with us, we have kind of one big mandate, right? Our belief is that the world is a better place with more creators in it. And what we mean by that is folks creating content and games and simulations and whatever else it might be, maybe new technology, new products. We want people creating and it's really like how we drive our business, right? This philosophy is centered around serving creators and it's how our company considers anything we're going to be doing. So really when we're trying to solve like engineering or data problems or anything like that, we are trying to solve those with the idea that when folks grab Unity and go to create, they can create better and they can create faster. It's all about enabling them and making things better regardless of their background. So a little bit of information about us. Uh, we're the leading platform for creating and growing interactive real-time 3D content. i will also like to mention that we're also one of the leading and growing platforms for making interactive real-time 2D content. Um, we provide a comprehensive set of software and solutions that let you run and grow real-time content. Um, and you can then publish it to PC, consoles, mobile devices, XR headsets, VR headsets, all kinds of stuff, right? So we have a massive group of things we can dive into and utilize for. And what we're seeing as a trend is that all the content that used to be static and flat is now really linear and it's real time and it's interactive. And I think this GIF really demonstrates that. You see them actually grab the tree and drag it across to the center and you can see the shadows actually changing in real time, right? And you see this beautiful light volume kind of up in between the trees. And as it moves through, it's occluding that and you're seeing all these shadows pop. And then you can look here and see that all of these rocks are movable. The trees are swaying, the branches are interacting, right? That's happening as new wind forces and new objects get added. And this trend we're seeing is that a massive amount of content is going to be this way. And it's going to increase at a grand scale. So the problem then lies in, well, who's going to make all the content? And that's where job opportunities come in for students, right? Because somebody has got to make the content and someone's got to build the tools to build the content. And that's where this industry is starting to really grow. So... We, of course, are used in some of the most popular games you've seen. Um, Angry Birds, Death Store, The Falconeer, Sableworks, Zenith. Uh, one of my favorite Made with Unity games is... Wow, I just completely lost my brain. I can literally see the logo in my head, and it's just gone. It was like, no, you know, it's not your favorite. Um, but I can think of the games like Hollow Knight, which is a really, really good 2D platformer. Uh, Abe's uh, Shadow Odyssey, which we just re-released a few years ago. Things like that. We are a massive part of the industry and using everything from mobile, VR, XR, and of course, console. But that being said, the beauty of games is that we're simulating the real world. So I like to think about Mario Brothers, right? And that engine they had to build to make that game. To make all those interactions happen, they had to build their engine. And to make Mario fall after jumping, they had to simulate their version of gravity, right? Then they had to think of, okay, how much force can, can be applied to Mario to make him jump high enough to withstand or beat that gravity and then come back down. That's, that's an example of a solution that has already been built and solved, right? And it's used in gaming constantly. Same with like lighting interacting and refraction and reflections and color and all this kind of stuff. So now when we've been doing that for games for so long, excuse me, it's very easy to then jump in and start doing this in other industries. So you look at like Walgreens and Volvo and Lowe's and Disney, Booz Allen Hamilton and more, they're using us to simulate not games anymore, but things they need to do, whether it's a digital shopping experience, 
I'm not sure if anyone's ever had this experience. Feel free to say so in the chat if you have, but you're buying furniture from, say, Target or Walgreens. Not Walgreens. Walgreens doesn't sell furniture. Maybe they do. Not my Walgreens. Um, but you're buying, you know, furniture from, say, Target or Ikea. And you just point your phone at the floor and then, like, the coffee table appears and you're, like, rotating it and then changing, like, the color of the coffee table and seeing how it matches your room, right? That's real-time 3D content in action right there, enhancing experiences. And a real-time 3D designer or a game designer had to help build those experiences. We look at things like Disney and the image you see there um, is an actual animated series they made fully for YouTube using Unity specifically. So we're moving film faster because instead of thinking, all right, well, I want to like scout this location, but it's in New Zealand and my studio is in Los Angeles. They can simply build a real-time 3D recreation of the location and then go, what would that look like at 5 p.m.? Rotate the light. Now we don't like that location. Let's go to another one, right? And they can start to use this to drive their visualization processes forward. Or they could just recreate it, put it up on a giant LED wall and film the actor as if they're there and they're good to go. Volvo or other automotive brands use this for safety training and testing, right? If you're going to design a new car and you want to see how it runs and looks like on the road, you could build the thing. Like you could build the car and take it on the road. Or you could take the car build a digital version of it, which you've already done in some kind of CAD modeling software to send off to manufacturing anyway, import that into Unity or a game engine, put it into virtual reality and let somebody test drive it without ever building the car. And so it saves you time and money. And then the person can give you feedback and you can take all these notes and say, okay, this works, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And then go and make those modifications and then get to a final lock design before you send it off for manufacturing. So it saves you a lot of work and a lot of money building it out that way. So a few stats for you. Um, computing occupations are the number one source of new wages in America. Uh, these come from the State of Computer Science Education by code.org, by the way. The CS degree earns a significantly higher return on investment than arts and humanities degrees, which is a bummer to say because I have an arts and humanities degree. Uh, the demand of computer science jobs are growing. 91% uh, of open software jobs are outside of Silicon Valley. And I think that's a really important thing to call out. So like, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I don't live in San Francisco. Um, there are software and tech jobs all over the world, and jobs tied to real-time 3D are also very, very global and very, very expansive. So demand for real-time 3D skills is growing at a 601% faster than the labor market overall. Demand for real-time 3D is growing 50% faster than the demand for the average amount of information skill. And real-time 3D roles offer 57% salary premium above some of the other salaries when compared. So it's a really fruitful market, and it's exciting. I want to add a note that I've said real-time 3D like five times, and I want to just level set with everybody. Real-time 3D is the ability to quickly render a detailed 3D image. So the way I look at that is you take quickly and you throw that out the window and you put real-time in its place. So it's the ability to render something in real-time. So instead of creating the thing, pushing the render button, waiting for processing, then seeing the thing, it's literally you make the change, you see the thing pretty quickly. Cool. So that is a lot of information given to you all kind of quickly. Any questions so far? Everyone feeling comfortable? We feeling good. I'm going to take a sip of water while I just look over the Q&A or see if anyone pops anything in. Okay. I'm going to take the silence as a no, you get it. Do you love everything I'm saying? And I'm going to keep going. So the reason we talk about all this stuff and what really drives me is the impact that we see with students. And so when it comes to students, the sky is kind of the limit to what they can achieve with this type of technology in their hands. These are a bunch of photos from visits I've done over the last few months, visiting schools and programs, all of them working on different things. So this is, oh, let's go back one. This is a school in Manitoba called New Media Manitoba. They actually work with high schools and teach them real-time 3D skills. These kids are all learning to sculpt. This kid right here in the black hoodie had just spent 20 minutes talking to me about coding and how to access the scripting APIs appropriately and how to make his character move correctly in the environment. This kid right here made a really, really cool VR experience where you actually were fighting little potatoes and shooting them with plastic darts. But the fun thing about his game is he decided that he didn't want to do any digital audio work as far as music. He recorded all of the sound effects with his own voice. So like when he fired the gun, it was like, it was super fun. 
down here, this is a game jam happening in Manitoba as well. Everybody in this room with their hands up are first time jammers and most of them around 17 years old. And the story I really want to call attention to is these young women right here. So I'm going to jump over here. So these young women are um, from um, Colorado Springs and they go to a high school there and they're working on projects for the Space Foundation in Colorado Springs, which is a nonprofit that has like a science laboratory where people can go and see all kinds of science stuff, learn about space, rockets, tech, all that really, really cool stuff, right? So their class uses Unity a lot and teaches, and they got a grant to use HoloLenses, which are AR headsets that you put on, and then you can see the world, and they'll super, superimpose things into the world, right? They're made by Microsoft. And uh, I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with Science on a Sphere, so I'm just going to talk about it really quick to make sure. Um, usually I ask and have you all raise your hand, but I can't, I can't see your hands. So I'm just going to pretend that I asked and you all were like, no, we have no idea what you're talking about, Tom. If you do know what Science on a Sphere is, feel free to plug your ears for the next two minutes. So Science on a Sphere is essentially, you have a sphere in the middle of a room and you're projecting celestial bodies onto the sphere so you can see it and walk around it, right? Kind of like in this picture. But then the problem these young ladies noticed is that you can't see into the orbiting bodies. So you, you don't see like the moons or belts of rocks or the rings, right? And so they were like, well, what if we did that? So they sat down in Unity and they built mesh targeting and set up to scale the rings for science on a sphere. And so what you see here in this really poorly taken dark photo I took, that they are actually wearing hollow lenses, demonstrating that you can stand there and now see all the orbiting celestial bodies. And at 17 years old, they identified this problem and they built the solution on their own. And that's now sitting as an exhibit at the Space Foundation so that people can see the science on a sphere as well. In that same classroom as an example, these three young men had just finished presenting part of their project along with the rest of the class of 12 to the, not head of Space Force, but like top four of Space Force, heads of the Navy, heads of the Air Force, and they had built a simulation in VR and XR where you could actually walk around and see spacesuits. They would expand and give you all the technical data on the spacesuit. You could see a rocket at scale, and you can also drive a Mars rover and test it. And this team of you know 15 high school kids was presenting tech that honestly was better than some of the tech demos I've seen at like professional business people conferences. And they were presenting it to very high ranking government officials at 17. Um, the other thing I really want to call out is when you put this tech in the hands of students, they start to naturally work with each other and collaborate. And they also start to kind of stretch and move into what they like to do. So a good example of this is I interviewed all these kids after we just sat and chatted for like an hour and a half. And one of the young ladies there was like, actually, I don't like this at all. Like, I don't like coding and I'm not really an artist. I don't want to do this. She's like, but what I did enjoy was I ran the project. And I was like, oh, what, what, what do you mean about running the project? She goes, well, I managed the relationship with the client. So I had meetings with them once a week. Also, here's all of my spreadsheets with timelines and deliverables and the things that I need all the developers to get and our different stages of the project. I'm like, you are a product and project manager. She's like, yeah. 17 years old. And like, she found her passion for project management, which is massively important in this industry, right? So even if she wasn't diving into the computer science side, she found what she wanted to do, dove in with the team and started building something incredible. So really cool stuff that honestly, it's not unique to this space. It just happens to be that this is the space I visited last year and I have that data, but it's something we see repeated over and over and over again, as this content is, in, is introduced. Okay. So that being said, let's talk about EdLab. So one of the things that we've noticed uh, as a company is that, you know, the real-time 3D software takes hardware, especially when you're rendering graphics in real time. You need you know, like a gaming PC, basically, right? You need a big graphics card, you need a good processor, you need a good bit of RAM, and that, that comes with a cost. And then it comes with a cost as well of maintaining those consistently, right? So Something else we realized is when, you know, lockdown hit and the pandemic started, all these schools, all these students had Chromebooks. Not a lot of things run on Chrome OS. Chrome OS is really about mobile browsing, that type of thing. So we stepped up, we set out as a team to say, hey, you know, we need to find a solution to get this tech into the hands of these students and help them build it. And that's where we came up with EdLab. So this is a classroom solution. It allows educators like yourself to create enriching solutions. Um, and really start teaching real-time 3D development to drive STEAM, science tech, all that good stuff. And you can partner with us to create opportunities for the youth to actually unleash creativity and build stuff. And they can do it all on a Chromebook. 
So instead of needing to buy like a gaming PC, their Chromebook with web access can now get them access to the Unity editor in the cloud and it runs in a Chrome browser or a Firefox browser or an Edge browser or a Safari browser or a Dolphin browser or Opera browser. I'm trying to think of all the web browsers, right? It runs in the cloud and they just run it remotely, which means hardware is no longer a barrier. It also means that if they are working on something at school and they take their Chromebook home, they don't have to worry about popping it into a USB drive or doing anything like that. They just log back in. And because it's cloud-based and the instance is saved, all of their work remains in the cloud and they can continue working. So it's really powerful in that way. There are, of course, also ways they can get it out of there if they want to, say, take the project and put it on another machine, but it's all available to them in the cloud. So what do you get with this? It comes with uh, cloud-based development, the editor, which I'll show you here in a sec. Um, you get flexible curricula and instruction. So we have curriculum specifically designed to align for EdLab. So how to do things in the cloud with that editing. You get an educator portal so you can manage your classroom. We also have student data anonymity available. So if you don't want to share any student data, instead of having their school email lined up with how they sign in, you can actually generate anonymous logins for the students and they will have those logins to use instead. Um, all of our content is aligned to um, the ISTE standards. Also, we have an AP computer science course as well for North America that goes along with that. So they can take that for AP computer science and use those to learn the same principles and take that course. And it's about certification preparedness for us, right? So we want we have a similar goal that all schools have. We want students to leave school ready to go to work, get a job, right? Pay bills, have a fun life, that stuff. That's what we're going for. And I'm sure most of you educators feel the same. So that's the point of this too, is then there's certifications available for them, specifically for K through 12. We look at the Unity user certifications and then collegiate and beyond. We look at the Unity certified associate. And then of course they can do like the professional once they've been in the industry for a little bit. Uh, like myself, I'm a Unity certified programmer. So they can kind of go through this, all these puzzle pieces to put it together. So again, benefits for students. It's fun and it's interactive. I think the thing for me when I was learning computer science in my early classes was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't love just printing text to a console. If you'll hear my dogs barking, by the way, say hello to them. Joe Penny or just wanting to be part of the webinar. They're always jealous when I'm presenting and they don't get to come like present with me. Um, but yeah, these students jump in, they become creators, they become it, contributors and they dive in. And because they're getting that immediate feedback, that instant feedback on what they're building, it's generally more exciting. And I'm not saying computer science isn't fun because I am a programmer, I love code. What I'm saying is that like, it's way more fun when you change something and you hit play and your code executes versus like, I'm gonna wait a little bit to see what happens, right? For educators, we give you that easy implementation. So you don't have to be a computer science expert or a programming expert to teach this. We actually have all the tools you need to implement this in the classroom right now, including um, lesson plans, standards alignment, syllabus or syllabi, excuse me, scope and, se scope and sequence, all that stuff. You're ready to go, you're ready to dive in. Um, our recommendation usually is like, stay half a day ahead of the class and you're good. And to be honest, Students usually end up teaching each other anyway because it's so fun. Uh, but yeah, as long as you're staying a half a day ahead of the class or so, you're usually in a pretty good place. Uh, that teacher that teaches that class from Colorado Springs I was referencing, he's a master's in English literature. He's an English teacher. They got pulled over to CTE. Um, if there's anybody internationally, just so you know, CTE is what we call, I think it's career technical education. That's where a lot of the computer science stuff falls in some of our schools. And after, you know, five years of it, he and I rap about Unity dev and coding all the time. Like, honestly, there's days where I think he's a better developer than I am, and I work here. So immersing yourself will take time, but it's worth that time. All right, so how it works, you access the portal, you view lesson plans and tutorials. I'll show you what that is. Then you use the EdLab roster to assign students and educators to the crew. And then you engage students through the EdLab editor through project-based learning. It's really kind of three easy steps, right? You look at your lesson plans, you send it out to them, and then you have them work on it. To implement it, um, there's all kinds of flexible course options you can dive into, right? So you've got all kinds of lessons about game design and development, computer science principles. I feel like I've said like a hundred times, but it's flexible instructional. So you can do like a year long for 30 weeks with like 150 hours. You can do a semester for 15 weeks of 75, quarter for 10, four weeks for 15. Or as you get further down the road, you can take it and slice it down smaller and just do it in your own workshop way how you want to dive into it, right? Um, that might be like an advanced way to implement it, but you absolutely can. And we have educators in our community that do that. So we have a pretty robust curriculum. 
for all of this stuff. So we have lesson plans um, on game design and the development, computer programming, um, AP, and CTE, of course. And then we have, of course, the different hours and time frames you're going to look at here. Um, and I'm sure Christy and the Studica crew can share this deck out so you can all look at it and share the recording so you have this for reference. Um, and we really want to focus on meeting educational priorities, right? So it's about teaching computer science, game development and design, and like supporting that like maker program, maker space mentality, right? There's a lot of overlap there where if you have a lab with like 3D printers, they can take the stuff that they're going to 3D print and put it into Unity and cause interactions. Um, we really want them to have career pathways and technical education where they can see themselves moving into getting jobs and doing all that work, right? Um, and of course, um, really powerful to have college partnerships and credits with the AP computer science stuff so they can go into college a little ahead of the game and start pushing forward. The other thing we're really big on about this app is equity in education, right? If I go to a kid and I say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to code, and this kid's from a family that doesn't have as much money, and I go, but first you've got to buy a $2,000 gaming PC to learn to code. Yeah, that, that's kind of moving the needle or moving them away from the situation, right? It's like, oh, I'll teach you, but you've got to put in a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. It doesn't work. But if I can come to that student and say, hey, you already have a Chromebook. Great. Here's a URL, sign in, let's start learning. That puts the ball in their court, start taking that and building those skills. And that was really the big deal about why we built something like EdLab is we wanted to make it accessible to everybody. And when I say everybody, our product team will never tell you to use this on a tablet, but I have run EdLab on a Galaxy Tab A7 and the only thing I the only thing I needed was a mouse and keyboard to plug into it, and it ran fine. Because all the processing is handled in the cloud, you're really looking for a screen and internet connection, which really changes things up. Okay, the slides tell me it's time to show you what I've been rambling about, so we should actually do that. Look at all my alt tabs. Let's see here. Ba -ba. Okay. Whoop -whoop. Oh, no, I got disconnected while I was talking to you all. All right, you're going to get to see the whole sign-in process live. I hope you're ready. I hope you're excited. So first, uh, it is a yearly subscription, yes. Um, it's per head. Uh, Christy and the Sudoku crew can let you know like how the pricing works. Unfortunately, I'm not a salesperson, so I don't actually know the pricing situation. I just know it is really cool. Uh, but we'll let the Sudoku crew handle that for you and let you know. So if we go to learn.unity.com, this is our portal where we like to store everything. So there's a bunch of content here to teach, but then if you have EdLab, you go to the four educators and you're going to access your EdLab portal. So looking in here, I have all of my resources available. So first of all, like, hey, how to get started as an admin, how to explore the EdLab editor, how to plan your curriculum and get to download a PDF guide. And then we have like our main courses here. So we have Create with Code, which is the Unity EdLab edition. Create with Code is a series near and dear to my heart, mainly because I taught it live for three years and it's very dialed into, you've never coded, you've never used Unity, let's get you going and let's get you there. And they build seven amazing prototypes. It's super fun. So we have the EdLab edition of that lined up. And if we jump to our learning resources tab, right, we have our game design curriculum. We have all your lesson plans for Create with Code along with your scope and sequence and your standards alignments and all your different learning modules. We also have the same for our computer science principles and curriculum. So I can literally hit download all resources, this beautiful zip file pops up. Whoop, whoop. I extract it all here. Watch as man extracts folder live. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so it loads up. And then we can start looking at, let's see, the APCSP. Blah, blah. And then we can start looking through all of our wonderful curriculum So You have all your computers, innovation, programming, algorithms, and of course the syllabus here and the appendix with exam prep. So it's all here and it's ready for you to use as a teacher out of the box. Whew. Okay, here's all your concept primers as well. Parenting, transform, variables, materials. Uh, parenting, by the way, is a term for unity, like making something the parent of an object. I don't think it's actually a course on how to be a parent, um, but it might be. Maybe we're trying to get double win. We'll say, you know what? Here's how to code and how to be a parent. We're trying to help you twice. So if with that, let's go back to... Where did you go, my beautiful loading setup? Let me show you in real time why you should not have 400 windows open. Oh, that's right, because I came in through here. So we're going to load it up just like I would. So I'm going to open Okta, which is the way that links up. And I'm going to open the Unity EdLab um, version. And this is all hosted on Amazon AppStream. So it goes there. 
And basically using my credentials is going to auto sign me in and we're going to watch this load. Uh, one thing I would always recommend when teaching a class with EdLab, and this is actually true for like building a game design, game dev project in general, that first build of the project takes a little bit longer than reopening the project. And it's because it's initializing a bunch of stuff. It's caching some things. It's importing parts of libraries it needs to make things work. So usually what I recommend doing when you're teaching this stuff in the classroom is have all your students start building a project. Say, hey, let's create a new project. And you'll walk them through, you know, how to do the template and make the new project. And then once they've hit create and it starts processing, that's a good opportunity to spend five to 10 minutes just giving a lecture on something or even five minutes, right? And by the end of that five minutes, everybody should be caught up, built, and ready to roll. So it's a good example of things you can fill time and also make sure you're maximizing that time with the students, right? So instead of making them watch this uh, beautiful, beautiful launching circle, they can actually go through and talk about different things, share some game ideas, learn some concepts, um, and do a bunch of other really fun things that they can tackle. So we're just going to let this kind of boot up and load right now. I think what's kind of fun to acknowledge is that like so far we're logging in. We're probably at about like a minute. Um, and this is after being signed out because I was inactive for so long. I was trying to be all prepared for you all. And now I'm being punished. So this is getting pulled in here. Um, and once it loads into the instance, basically you are able to get working. Oh, something I forgot to mention that I think is really cool about this. So something I help deal with a lot is working with schools to install Unity or any program on a physical machine, right? And that runs into all kinds of IT concerns. Um, we don't allow students to write to the C drive. Students can't have network access to these certain URLs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this actually fixes a lot of that because you're not installing it on any physical machines. So basically your school network just allow, has to allow them to get to the app stream instance and they're good and they're, they're set, right? And if they can access that machine, they're good to go. And of course we have our app stream instances locked down so that they're not able to like go surf the web or do anything dangerous like that. So that is another way that we make sure to look out for and protect the students. Any questions while this finishes loading? Of course, this was asking if you have questions, it's done. It's like, no, nah, man, not even happening. Okay. So here is the Unity Hub. Loads up inside of Amazon App Stream. Uh, if I hit this little button here, I can look at my different. So I have my Explorer, my Visual Studio Code, which is what we use for coding here, uh, which also doesn't use any student data. And I want to open Explorer first to show you all the way the folders are broken down. So they actually get this Unity Projects and Assets folder, which has all of the content they need to go through this stuff. So they've got their computer science principles packages, like the what is a computer, as an example, and then their internet and security package as well that they'll need to use. And then they can actually go in and create new projects or add projects. I'm actually going to add a previous project from disk. And let's go ahead and use, let's see how the carding one's looking. Let's add carding. Carding is one of my favorites. Okay, and we'll load that up. So this is a carding micro game that you can set up and teach them for. This is a really fun one for early game design stuff. Oh, okay, I tried to open it twice and it got mad. Um, the reason why I like carding is it's Mario Kart-esque, but they learn to mod, modify tracks, move objects around, create goals. It's just a really like fun setup. So we're gonna let this just load up for us right here. Um, and if you didn't notice, like there's my URL, like this is just, it's just Chrome, big chilling in Chrome. Mm -hmm. So this is another one of those instances where this is like just opening my existing project. It usually takes, I don't know, like a minute, minute and a half to get all that done, right? Again, it's just because it's compiling a bunch of data. It's checking to make sure the code will work correctly. If there's anything it needs to import, it's pulling it in, doing all that kind of work. You are. Uh, so someone asked, uh, Lions District asked, are we able to bring in assets we create? We have a full tutorial on how to do that, but you actually can upload um, assets to your class instance and share it with students as well. So if you create some 3D assets you want to use to teach, you can absolutely add those. And those exist inside these learning resources and tutorials. Uh, we have tutorials on how to do that built in here. All right, project open. So. I'm going to full screen this. So we're now looking at carding inside EdLab running in the cloud. So I can start like zooming in, it's a little too far, looking at my cart racer here. 
And right off the jump, we can start building and creating. Oh, my name is Mac. All right, good to meet you, Mac. No problem. Didn't know if there was like an entire district zoomed in from a classroom or, you know, you never know. So we've got this all kind of set up here. And if I wanted to go in and start modding this, I could look at like my mod assets and maybe go look at some of these 3D props. The one I always like to pick when I'm doing this, I think it's just space props, food props. Maybe it's mod resources. Maybe they took away my favorite one. There's this giant bowling pin and it makes me really happy, but I don't see it. So uh, we'll do the arches instead. So I can actually drag an arch in and start working with it. Like I can scale it up. And I can start moving it with some move tools and it's still not quite big enough to fill this space. Whoop. Beautiful. So now we have this cool like arch that we're going to drive underneath. And I think there's a ramp you can use as well. Let's go see food props. Let's go to mod assets, cart. We got hats, particles, stylized stuff. Hmm. Here's an environment folder in here, carting. This is a good point to say you should always organize your things. But the fact is, it's here. I hit Control S and it saves. And then if I want to play the carding game, I can just hit play. Hopefully it doesn't blast you all with sound. I'm going to loosen one of my headphones just in case it blasts me with sound. Okay. And so now I'm playing a carding game. So I can actually run through, test my changes, look at like what the world looks like. And all of this can be done, like I said, in real time in the cloud. They don't have to worry about. They don't got to worry about other problems. So that's, I wish there was like more flashy stuff to show you, but it's, it's exactly what we say it is, right? It's the Unity editor running inside of a cloud instance so you can do it hardware free. Um, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this. I've tested it on a bunch of stuff too. So when, when I first started at Unity, a few months after I started, this product was about to launch. So they were like, well, you're the Unity guys, dev. So uh, go test it. So I grabbed my laptop and I just drove around Utah where I live. And I went to like every coffee shop I could think of with bad Wi-Fi just to like see how bad it could be, right? And it worked at every single one of them. So it, it's great. I used it hotspotted on my phone the other day. And it worked pretty well. Um, so it's it's really built for that power. The one thing about the phone hotspot, I will say, is generally hotspotted phone connections have a lot of latency. So it wasn't as smooth as like an actual like dedicated Wi-Fi router, but it was still good. Okay. So that means we can go back to our slide deck and start talking about um, a couple things. This is a video. I'm not going to play it because it's actually a video that I'm in and I just talk about EdLab. Uh, so when Studica shares out the deck, you can watch that video if you want more information. It's also a really good resource if you're talking to people about it and you want to give them a quick overview of like, they're like, what's an EdLab? You can show them this video. And it's basically what I've been saying for the last like 30 minutes, but it's condensed into like three. So it's a really good pitch video you can show them if you're interested. It's also just gives you, you know, quick overview. So we're going to jump past this. And yeah, with that, I would say if you got questions, hit me with them and I will do my best to answer them. Oh, and thank you for the questions you asked you asked already. Yeah, I like it too. It's pretty cool. I'm glad you're I'm glad you like it. I think it's definitely worth looking into. Um it's about getting tech in the hands of the students. So oh, I love that question, Suzanne. Can absolute beginners do well in game development? Yes. Um so the learning curve issues I see. Um, you know, it's it there's there's two things that are gonna be an obstacle for you. One is if you're talking absolute beginner, as in like not a lot of computer skills, period, you may want to help them overcome that hump a little bit, right? Like understand how to navigate file structures and use a mouse and a keyboard, like that kind of stuff. Um, but otherwise, absolute beginners to game development and code, yes. And our content's actually built that way. Um, since you asked, let's go to learn. Let me show you what I mean. So if I go to create with code, which is the first half of the junior programmer pathway. 
do, 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 and we'll go to unit one. We'll go to player control. So this is the unit about how to get player input and start controlling stuff, right? So we have it all broken down into introduction, and then we have start your 3D engines. Excuse me. So if I go to start your 3D engines, we can start to see how the tutorial works. So first it's like, hey, let's start with our building a course folder, right? So we have a video that walks you through, narrated by my friend Carl. And then from there, we actually give you the steps written. And we start to kind of implement upon that. So now let's talk about how to import assets and open a prototype. Now let's talk about how to add a vehicle to the scene, how to drag objects and put them into scene and how to navigate in 3D space. Now let's talk about repositioning, right? Let's talk about locating your camera and running the game to test it and like moving stuff and parenting. So we really go through the step by step by step piece to show you how to get through all of that. Um, the other thing I love is if we go to, I think it's high speed chase. We're testing my memory right now. If I can remember exactly what each module teaches. Um, so in high speed chase, we start diving into some more code, right? So we first say, okay, we need to integrate a speed variable. Actually, no, let's go back one lesson. I was a little ahead of time. I want to show you how we teach coding. Um, a mentor of mine early in my days always told me code like a jerk and fix it later. And we teach kind of with that mentality, except that we don't tell the kids to be jerks. We say, hey, let's teach you to code it. And then let's show you how to refine that code to be more elegant and to be more cleaner and more optimal, right? And that's how we're teaching them. So we're we're starting at the base and we're kind of building those skills on top as we go through. So we create their scripts folder. So first thing we have them do is we add a, add a comment, right? And we're, okay, we're gonna add a comment. And commenting is stuff that doesn't execute. It's notes for yourself or notes about what your stuff does. So we show them how to do that. And so we're saying, hey, say you're gonna move the vehicle forward, step one. Then we need to actually move the vehicle forward. So we're going to tell it to transform.translate, and we talk about what the methods are and how they work. And we're going to say this takes a vector three, zero, zero, one. So very basically, we're saying move one unit in the Z direction constantly. And then they're going to hit play. And spoiler alert, when they do that, the car goes flying off into nowhere because that means every frame it's moving three meters and there's 60 frames a second. So it's moving 180 meters a second. So the thing just goes away. Um, and then we say, okay, that wasn't optimal. Maybe we need to change how we're moving you forward. So let's, instead of having zero, zero, one, let's learn about vectors and how there's a vector three class that actually gives you the forward direction. And then we set that up. So they've now deleted this piece out of the next piece. And we just keep stepping on things like that. Okay, now let's customize the speed our vehicle goes at. So we'll give it a speed of 20. Now let's add some physics. So we, we really step it up slowly and slowly and they slowly refactor this code. And by the end of it, they've actually written their own custom function, called it in the update method. And they're now calling a function that they wrote themselves. And so they're learning all of those principles. But we're taking through it step by step by step. And again, like as the educator, if we go here, first of all, you can have your students access the site and go through these steps and work through it with them. But also as the educator, we have all of that stuff in our lesson plans for you. Um, and it's literally like a PDF that you can flip through and work through as well along with them. So you've got that as a guide. Okay. Uh, happy to answer more questions. I think we have about seven minutes left, if I'm correct, Christine. Yep, we're um, good. Cool. <laughs> also, if you've been sitting all day, you can stand up and stretch. It feels nice. How can I get me to come talk to you? Um, so uh, I do that as part of my job. Um, full disclosure with the way the tech economy has been right now, me being able to travel is not high. But um, I'll put my email in here. If you shoot me an email, like I would, I would love to hop in on a Zoom call and say hey to your class, answer questions, just chat with them. Or um, if you need to convince some district higher ups, this is really important to put in, like work through Sudika and Christy. And if they want me to join in a call and talk to some of the, the brass or whatever, I don't, I don't want to call like upper administrative people. I guess like let me know, and I'd be happy to do so. And I agree. Yeah, the biggest obstacle will be cost. Uh, that's fair. Um, not a government funding expert, but you know there are there is government funds available in different avenues I've heard to help cover some of these things. Um, but I would I would recommend talking to people smarter than me. I'm more of a programmer and less of a a businessy person. But oh yeah, that's actually um, so I have had schools that I worked with before. This has been mainly at the collegiate level. Um, 
but they are using some of their esports budget to cover game design stuff, which I think is really interesting. So it'd be worth looking at. Um, and you offer comp principles and AP comp science. So that, that might be a really good tie-in for this. Yep. It's not a bad idea. And, you know, from my perspective, so I, I run a small esports production thing outside of when I'm not working my day job here, which I love. Uh, we do a lot of fighting game work. And the carryover in the community and the skills is um, pretty consistent, right? Like, I that's the thing about esports that I love. And this is like a total side rant is like, yes, the competitive gaming aspect of it is amazing, but also like all of the production people behind it, learning video encoding and data transfer rates and networking and production software. It's, there's a lot of that too, right? And that all overlaps with the fact that, oh, you learn all this stuff and then you learn unity and then you start combining the two. Anyway, it's, it's great. It's a really great setup. Fun fact, Unity actually has a virtual production setup, so you could technically use Unity to, say, put your commentators for an esports event on the moon. Kind of fun. I put a buddy in a fake studio. It was pretty great. A lot of cool stuff you can do there. All right. Well, I'm happy to say last call for any questions if anybody has any. And uh, if not, I can pass it back over to Christy to tell you all what to do with all this information. I just yelled at you on the internet. <laughs> well, I just wanted to let everybody know that if you do have any questions, I know I've got a couple emails already looking for um, pricing and information. You can just email me at the address I provided or info at studica.com. Um, you can check out our website. We are a Unity authorized reseller for education, so we'd be happy to help and answer your questions for you. And just a reminder that I will send that follow-up email with a link to the recording and the slides in a few days. And I just wanted to thank you all for being here. And obviously thank Thomas for that awesome presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure you did as well. So just thank you everyone. And we appreciate you being here.